Okay. Um, hello and welcome to Make It Easy uh, for the webinar on Canoe. Uh, my name is Marius Dalia. Uh, I work for Spidersoft as a vehicle simulation uh, developer, meaning that I create uh, simulations in Canoe and maintain them for uh, all the needed uh, projects, let's say. And I've worked in the past, um, like 10 years uh, with, uh, with this vector canoe tool. And I started as a tester and then moved on to, to develop uh, only the canoe simulation and without the, the testing part of his use. Okay, so uh, let's see uh, what can you do in Canoe and how to do it. Okay, so let's start with some uh, introduction. Uh, we all know that uh, modern cars have a lot more uh, equipments uh, as they did in the past. So a lot of uh, wires and a lot of uh, extra devices. We even have internet in our cars and we have connections with a lot of devices on Bluetooth. Uh, we have a lot of controlling units, so ECUs, which uh, handle the engine, uh, the wheels, um, the doors or whatever the, the devices and all the functionality of the car. And because of this, uh, the complexity and um, the information that it's needed to be exchanged between all of these devices for the car to, to work properly uh, has increased a lot. And we can see, uh, let's take, for example, this kind of, uh, let's say, presentation in a simple form of how um, the, um, the data and the networks inside the car, which uh, send information to, to sensors or to actuators and take information from sensors or actuators, and it goes back to an ECU or another sort of device. And then it, everything has to connect to maybe a, gate, a gateway um, between all of these networks and act as an let's say arbiter that uh, hand, uh, receives all the, all the information and sees what information is needed and where it should go. And then uh, it forwards, it takes something from one bus, uh, maybe changes it uh, and sends it out on a different bus. So we can see that we, have, we can have um, a lot of different um, types of networks. So we don't have only can or only lean or only ethernet in our cars. We have all of them mixed in such a way that maybe some costs are saved for some low priority or low complexity sensors. For example, it could be a lean link between that and the uh, bigger ECU that handles everything regarding that sensor. Or uh, we could have some uh, CAN bus between uh, some ECUs that have uh, the same functionality or maybe a functionality that's uh, in a way interconnected with these other issues on the CAN bus. So we, could, we can have uh, multiple types of networks and a lot of issues on each network and then gateways between them and sensors and actuators and a lot of devices. And every one of these devices uh, has to send and receive information all the time. So from the moment you start your car, until uh, it's stopped and parked and uh, everything is shut down, a lot of information is exchanged uh, very fastly. Okay, um, let's see um, what kind of uh, network of communication protocols uh, can be found in our cars. So like I said, there could be uh, a CAN network, uh, which comes from controlled area network. Uh, which is quite a simple network. Uh, it has, uh, it's uh, constructed on a pair of two twisted wires and its structure is like in the pictures shown over here uh, with uh, all the CAN nodes connected to CAN high and CAN low and having a um, termination resistor at each end of the communication 
to prevent reflections on the bus and interference. And each of this, uh, of this scan node uh, sends all of the IDs assigned, all of the messages that it has assigned from uh, when they designed the car and this ECU and this network with all of the ECUs. So each ECU will send its information. Uh, it, will, it will have, for example, uh, the first CAN node will have seven IDs that it has to send and receive uh, five IDs and take them into consideration, let's say. And the next uh, CAN node will send uh, five uh, messages and receive two and take them into consideration for its algorithms and what uh, it has to do uh, afterwards with this information and so on. And all of this communication happens, uh, let's say, for the sake of simplicity at the same time. Uh, so all of these um, CAN messages have IDs on this uh, CAN network and they will be sent if uh, more of them uh, can uh, have to come on the on the the same time uh, then there will be an arbitration taking place so the id which is lowered uh, will have priority and it will be it will be sent first on the bus and then the next one in order of id it will be sent and so on they also have um, um, they they have to come cyclically some of them, they are some of them which come on request or on command or uh, whenever one event is happening. But uh, most of them uh, have a cycle time and they are repeated periodically based on that cycle time on the bus. Okay, and we can have, um, let's say, improved uh, version of the CAN bus, which is called uh, CANFD. So this is a CAN bus with flexible data, data rate in which uh, the, in the normal CAN, you can send up to only eight bytes on each message. And with CANFD, you can go up to 64 bytes because uh, on CANFD, um, the timing that it takes to send one byte of information can be shortened. And then um, on CANFD, uh, more bytes can be squeezed in the same or more or less the same amount of time. And then let's uh, see another type. So we have CAN and it's more advanced version of the CANFD. And then we can have a lean network, which is the cheapest one and the most simple one. Uh, it only has one wire uh, for communication. The structure is different, so we don't have any more uh, can high or, high or low or plus or minus or something like this. Uh, we have just one wire for communication and we have a different structure, so not all the nodes will send and receive more or less on the same, in the same time. Um, on LIN, uh, we have a master which is controlling the, the communication and we can have multiple slaves which listen on the bus and whenever the master that tells them to, to send something, uh, they will send that required information. And also the slaves will receive from the master, um, they can receive uh, some frame and uh, they can act based upon it, based on the information. Let's say there's a frame which has one signal which tells one particular slave to activate uh, a motor, let's say. And whenever that signal is one, then that motor should start spinning. And um, the master will send uh, this frame to control one particular slave and the slave that knows it has to listen for this particular command. Whenever it is on the bus, uh, it will check the value of the signal and then start, for example, activating the motor or uh, opening the window or whatever action uh, it's needed out of this slave. So this is a much simpler um, structure for the for the lean bus. It's much cheaper. Uh, it's not used only in automotive. It is used, for example, also in washing machines. We could have some small lean bus connecting the sensors or actuators between the control unit and uh, this adjacent uh, devices. But Mainly it's used also in automotive uh, to connect smaller uh, smaller parts and smaller devices. 
with a bigger one, which then translates maybe into CAN or CANFD or maybe into Ethernet and transmits further the information coming from the lean side. That's it. Okay, so we had CAN, CANFD, and LIN. And what uh, we have, um, another type of bus, it's Ethernet, but it's not our uh, normal Ethernet in our homes and everywhere. It's automotive Ethernet, um, which is a little bit different. We will not go maybe uh, so much into details, but um, this is much faster. Uh, in the past, uh, they had one type of bus called FlexDay which was faster than can, but it was pretty expensive. And now Ethernet comes and it's a lot more faster than even FlexDay. And uh, it's not with uh, not a so increased uh, cost uh, compared to, to FlexDay. Okay. So here I presented a small example. So we could have uh, two networks interconnected in a car. Let's say, for example, a CAN and a LIN. And we have our structures, and then we have with orange a little node, which is called usually a gateway. So this uh, gateway node um, makes the link between CAN and LIN. Let's pretend that on CAN, uh, some command needs to be sent to the window to open, and the unit controlling the opening of the window uh, is on LIN. It communicates on LIN. Then uh, the command to open the window will be sent on CAN. It will go to this uh, gateway uh, node. Then on the gateway, it will take the information from one signal, for example. And this signal will be translated into a signal on a LIN frame and sent further on the LIN network by the gateway node uh, to the concerned uh, LIN issue, which should do the action, for example, open the window. So we see that we have a lot of information exchanged and we have a lot of signals and messages and a lot of data and networks and different types of networks, different speeds, different uh, wires, everything is different between them. And for us in uh, um, research and development, um, we need to get all of this data uh, somehow on a PC hopefully, and be able to see it first and then maybe modify it, maybe simulate um, some situations, maybe simulate some conditions to trigger a certain action from uh, the issue we develop. And to do this, uh, we need some interface between the PC and the real issue. And for sure, we will not have, so every engineer will not have uh, his own car on for each project that he works on. Then we need a program or something, an interface to simulate all of this and to translate all of this from issue to PC. Okay. And here, um, Canoe enters, let's say. So there's a company, Vector, who makes a software, Canoe, uh, for some years now. Uh, this software does um, exactly what I said that was needed. So we take information from our control units that we develop and we put it through a um, network interface, a hardware network interface, which captures the data from a CAN, a LIN, an Ethernet, FlexLay, or whatever the bus is. And then it will translate everything and connect it via USB to a PC. And with this vector canoe software, you can see all the exchanges, all the data. You can see the messages, the signals, values, whatever, timings, uh, what commands are sent, what, um, what, uh, how the signals are changed, and so on. And you can even simulate. So like I mentioned, not every engineer will have uh, his own car at the desk for each project that uh, he needs to work on. But uh, all of the projects will have a canoe simulation, hopefully, and uh, by doing certain settings and receiving certain databases which describe the network that that issue is a part of, um, we can simulate everything and, uh, let's say, make a certain condition or a certain um, situation happen on the bus 
and then see how the ECU reacts. So if it shuts the windows or not, or if a certain pin becomes active or not, or whatever the, the reaction should be. Okay, so I've said that we need this software canoe, but this uh, canoe comes with a license. So if you have just a software, you cannot use it. You need also to have a license for it. Uh, Vector offers um, a demo license. Uh, right now, the demo version offered by uh, Vector is Canoe Demo 17 Service Pack 3. And if you have a normal bot license, not a demo one, uh, that one could be of three types. So there is Canoe Pro, Canoe Run, and Canoe Packs. We can see over here, if you go in Canoe to Environment and Licensing, you can have a look. If you have a demo, then you have access to all of the bus types supported in Canoe. And you can do limited stuff, but you can try it out and try every bus. Uh, like we see in this picture, uh, Flex the Ethernet, uh, leave all of the options are available. And if you have a normal license, then it depends um, on your license. If it has a license, so the normal license, it has CAN and the ability to open Canoe and edit if it's pro and uh, um, write some code, do some panels, uh, see information and so on. Uh, if it's run or packs, then you are limited. You cannot edit. Uh, you can only have a look. With packs, it's uh, even the look uh, is more limited. But uh, you should also buy a license if you want to use Lean or uh, Flexstay or XCP, for example. Then that's uh, sold additionally. And if your license doesn't have XCP or Lean or these extra options, then you'll not be able to activate it. Uh, in this window. So keep in mind that just a license for opening canoe, it gives you access to can and that's about it. And let's see. Okay. Uh, so this is what I've told until now. And uh, all of the checking of the licenses is done at startup. So whenever you start your canoe program, uh, it will do a check for the license. If it's not detected, let's say you'll get an error that you'll have only limited capabilities and cannot run the simulation. If it's a demo, you'll get another pop-up saying that it's a demo and you have some limited capabilities and you can use only four nodes. And if it's a normal one, then you will not get any um, pop-ups, let's say you'll get just something in the right window, which will let you know what kind of license you have. So if you have can option, lean option activated, then it will uh, be displayed there in the right window. Uh, just as a interesting info, let's say the difference in price, it's quite big between pro uh, run and PEX. So the pro licenses are 100% of the cost and run it's let's say, about 60% and PEX it's much cheaper, but offers very little. It's only 20%. And these licenses, we have to have them in somehow present uh, on our PCs. So this could be done either with an USB dongle or the license could be mapped directly to a PC locally, or it could be mapped to a vector inter network interface device, a VN. So those devices that connect to ECUs and translate the communication uh, back to the PC, they can also have a license or more licenses mapped to them. Okay. Here, um, I put a short uh, visual representation of what Canoe Pro offers, compare them to Canoe Run and Canoe Pex. So with Pro, like I mentioned, you have the full features. Uh, you can edit, you can do design of the simulation. So you can move your windows, you can create your panels, your buttons, LEDs, uh, visual contours, whatever you want. You can write code, you can write uh, test modules or um, simulation nodes, and you can change everything, um, all of the settings and configuration of the test modules. You can uh, move it around and uh, make your desktops out of panels and traces and whatever you like. With RUN, uh, you lose the ability to design the simulation and the tests. So you can only have um, 
uh, abilities to to see everything, to see the traces, to see um, the panels that were previously made, buttons, LEDs, the test cases, you can execute them, you can click on the buttons and start the actions that are behind those buttons in the, in the simulation node. And with PEX, this is even more limited than uh, RUN, and this only allows you to use panels, so you don't have access to traces or graphic windows. You don't have access to diagnostic windows either. So for RUN, you have access to that, and um, you can only use a simulation which was previously uh, created by somebody, and that somebody should have made uh, a lot of panels to replace these features that we miss, so the trace or the graphic, which can display useful information and you can change uh, your signals or whatever you want to simulate on your uh, in your RBS. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I've talked a lot about uh, information and buses and networks. So all of this information, it has to be presented in some way to Canoe, and Canoe should take it from somewhere and be able to translate to see which ID uh, is, has which name and which signals are mapped to every message ID or frame ID, and then see the cycle time, for example, and how, how often that particular uh, frame should come on the bus and simulate it maybe. And this is done um, based on some databases. So we have databases for all of the bus types. And these databases are made um, usually by the OEMs that make the cars. So they make a database for each network in their car. And um, from there, every supplier or whoever does the, the ECUs will have a look, OK, uh, my ECU is part of this network over here and we need a database for uh, this particular network, then they will receive it from the OEM, and um, they can uh, insert it into Canoe, this database received, and then if they connect it to an ECU, then all of the information will be decoded, meaning that we will not see only one ID, uh, and that's it for the one message, we'll have a name, and then we have a decoding of the bytes into signals, and each signal will have some names and maybe some uh, measuring unit. For example, if it's speed, it will have uh, maybe kilometers per hour or meters per second or whatever the measuring unit is. <coughs> and Canoe has a component called uh, Canoe Interaction Layer, which takes all of this information um, from a database and uh, it will um, send uh, all of the messages and it will know when you change something in a panel, okay, I have to change the value of this sign all over here. So let's see, there are different uh, types of uh, extensions, let's say for the database, so the different file types. So we could have for the CAN or CANFD or DBC, or an AutoSAD XML and AR XML uh, type of file. Uh, both of them can describe a CAN or Kennedy network. Then uh, we could have an LDF, for example, a Lean description file for the Lean network. And for uh, automotive internet, we have uh, Fibex or also AutoSAD XML, like it was for CAN, that can be described in uh, both of these uh, file types. Okay, uh, the different um, ways in which you can control the sending of messages and the uh, changing of the values of the signals sent in each message. So you can uh, change it via some default node panels from Canoe. We could have, if we use a model generation wizard to generate our panels based on a database, we have these uh, automatically generated panels, which we can interact with and change all of the values, uh, change the behavior, maybe stop the message, maybe change the cycle time. Then we could have some custom panels made by the user to change the value or stop the message or change the cycle time, for example. And then we could have some other types of nodes. So not, uh, not issue nodes. In this case, they are different. They are interactive generator, for example, 
and we can have a replay block. And we will see uh, all of our information inside uh, trace windows and graphics windows or data, data windows, for example. And there we can organize our information, filter it, uh, search for a certain message, search for a certain signal. We could display it in a different way chronologically or um, only the recent, only the most recent instance of a certain message or frame. And we can do things with it, check the, um, the timestamp, for example, in a trace and check also the timestamp on a graphics window and um, check what happened at, I don't know, 100 seconds after the simulation was started. We started some action and we could see every message impacted or how, what the, the ECU sent on the bus at that particular moment or from that moment onwards, let's say. Um, you can filter uh, for this and you can put uh, and see exactly only that part that you need or want. And let's have a look now a little bit inside Canoe because let's see it more practically. So here um, I have one uh, Canoe simulation opened. So this is a sample configuration um, uh, provided by Vector and created by them, a very simple one. Let's say, let's see what kind of structure we have over here. So we have a network described, uh, it's a CAN network. We have some nodes over here and an interaction, gen an uh, interactive generator. And let's see um, from simulation and from simulation setup. Uh -huh. Some measurement set up. Let me move my windows a little bit. And okay. So let's see these nodes and let's see what we can get if we try to simulate this. So now we have no. Um, no real ECU connected. We only have some simulated um, issues and messages and signal and let's start it up. And here you can maybe uh, pin if you want important information to always stay up in the list of updating messages. You can unpin them, uh, you can expand and have a look and see the signals inside. So here we have a message which has a D 123 and it's called engine state. Um, its length is of two bytes and uh, inside these two bytes we have two informations, the engine speed and on off. And if we turn the car on, let's say the ignition on, we can have a, a look and see that we interacted with this button over here in the panel and our change can be seen on the bus. And this is transmitted via CAN. And now if we have a uh, go and change the speed or maybe uh, start the headlights or maybe the hazard flasher, we can, we have here a very nice visual representation made inside this sample configuration which can also uh, show you more visually, let's say, and more intuitive uh, what's happening. And we can have a look. So this is in the trace window. We have look and see uh, by ID and by name and search our messages, our signals. We interact with the panel and change the values and we can see that uh, the values are changed. And then we have this, um, what's called a graphic window. And here we have a different uh, visual representation of the same uh, signals. So we can see uh, if ignition is on and off, we can see if the hazard flasher is on and off. And when we turn it on, we can see the toggling. So coming from zero to one, uh, turned on off repeatedly and so on. We can see everything. We can have a pause and we can navigate through our history of data and see over here, uh, let's put a marker and have a look 
at the timestamp. For example, let's change, let's make this window bigger and also display this part and we go to lights and we could put a marker and see the timestamp and the value at this time time so we can have a look over here and see that our timestamp is exactly 53.9 and we could measure uh, some signals so let's measure for example how long um, this flashing light signal stays on one and i've put this second marker over here and put it on my signal and let's see now so it's from this time stamp to this time stamp and we can see over here uh, the exact difference in time uh, between the two the two instances and then we can measure how for how long this signal uh, has been one uh, similarly, we could switch it and see for how long um, it has been zero and so on. We could see, uh, for example, if we move over here to engine speed and if you go to our lowest value and our topmost value, you we could see a time, uh, how long did it take the engine speed to reach from zero to the maximum value, which is this one over here. Okay. Let's make it small again and let's see the same thing on the trace window. So in the trace window right now, uh, there's a mode activated that will replace every time um, the values with the latest instance of this message, but we could switch to a chronological view, for example. And then you have, if I stop for a bit, I can see engine state at the timestamp 221.9. I can see it coming with a different timestamp and it's new values. If it was new in our case now, uh, we can see that it's the same. And if we, we could go uh, back in our data history and have a look and see, okay, we had these values in the past. So here we had zero and um, no. So here we had zero. Uh, I've mistaken the signals. And here we had some value and it was still the same. If we go even further back, let's see if we can find the transition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's check the transition with the graphics window, see the timestamp and then check in the trace. So for example, if I move back to flashing light, which has a simpler transition, let's say, we can see at 54.6, okay, okay, and move back to our trace window, see if we can go back this much. And if I go even further, let's do it again and have a simple example. So we start the hazard flasher, okay. And now we stop the trace and the graphics window. And we have our graphics window. We can see a timestamp over here. So, okay, 304, round about. And then if we go in our trace window at 304, we could see uh, our transition. So let's open up the flashlight. Uh, okay. Over here. So let's minimize the engine. And we could see our transition, a moment of, uh, of this toggling of uh, the flashing light. So now in this instance of the message, we have the value zero. And then uh, in the next one, we had the value one. So this is, you can have a look. Uh, based on this um, timestamp and you can uh, compare and find whatever you see on the graph always on the trace at the exact, uh, exact uh, timestamp because this information is the same. So on the bus, the signals uh, were behaving um, just in one way and then we just have a different kind of uh, view, different kind of um, 
nodes inside Canoe that handles the viewing of information. And we could, uh, based on the same timestamp, find it in both in trace and then in graphic window. We can see that we can see it over here inside the data window also. So in the data window, let's make it bigger and let's see how we can add something. We could add a signal and we already have speed, headlight and flashlight, let's add on off. So here, over here in the data window, you can add signals or variables and check the value in real time, let's say, and have it always on or on display and check all the time the current value of your variables or signals. So all of these uh, windows, trace, data, and graphics can be brought up by going over here in the upper tabs to analysis. And then you have trace and it's just trace for me. You have graphics, okay, it's these graphics. And then in data, we have the data window. If I need a second data window, for example, I can go to data and open a new one, give it a name, Let's say data window two, it's good. And then it will open it for me. I can arrange it. I can make it snap uh, in my desktop or make it standard window. Now it's jumped to my other screen and I can bring it back. Now it's a standard uh, Windows window. I can have it over here and see it in Windows. I can make it a docking window, but it will occupy a lot of space for me. And let's change it back to MDI. Maybe put it over here. And it's the same with trace. You can create a new trace with different settings. Uh, graphics window, the same. Give it a new name. Uh, you can have different filters or different signals and information for um, different stuff in your second, third, or whatever uh, graphic window. Okay, so this is um, one way that you can change uh, information and the multiple ways that you can uh, display it. Let's see now if I attempt to change, change back to this view. And let's see if I use the interactive generator to change the value, not the panel anymore. So I open my panel by double clicking the interactive generator node. Um, this node we have to stop the simulation and we can add this node, but by going to our uh, network description inside Canoe, and we can insert the pan interactive generator or a replay block, which is also mentioned in before by me. And let's see for now, let's delete the replay block and let's see the interactive generator. And now we go to our, so, we have the window, we can move it in our desktop for easier, um, let's say, make it easier for you to display and organize for easier organization of all of your information and hidden panels. Could close this data window. And you can add over here a frame from the database. In my example, I already have um, one frame added the engine state, and if I make it over here, I can send it manually once upon pressing uh, this button, or send it periodically with some cycle time that I want. I can change it to something, let's say this one. And then if I hit play over here, I can see that uh, it's coming on the bus. Now it collides with the, the normal simulated uh, values. And we have Whatever we set inside here, we can uh, see it also uh, in our trace. Let's make the um, cycle time smaller, and then we will not have any more colliding. Okay, and let's simulate it now, and then it's all the time stuck uh, on our values. So we could change from here off, for example, and we can have a look that it's off. We could also do it from the panel to be the same. So now it's on and now it's off. This one is interfering, I have to stop it. And then when you use the panel, uh, if you stop your interactive generator, then um, you can control it via the panel. Okay. 
Okay, let's switch back to our presentation. Okay. Okay, so we've seen how we can see the information, how we can control the information. Okay, we already seen the trace and the graphic window. Okay, and before finishing, let's have one more look inside Canoe. So this was an example um, for Ken. Let's see another sample configuration from Vector. This time it's within a different um, data bus. And things look uh, quite similar. We have, uh, again, IDs and some names for all of the lean frames which are sent. Uh, they have signals, just like the CAN ones, that are just transmitted on a different protocol. But in Canoe, we can see that you can easily uh, see all of the decoded info, and you can have a look on your values and see your signals, see uh, with which timing they come. We can also have here a data window. Let's interact with this panel. And now the car is unlocked. Let's lock it. And we can see over here that some value has changed. And now we have the status here as locked. Let's unlock it again. And then it's changed um, back to one, meaning unlocked. And we see some other displays of the, the lights. So now they are off, they turned off after a while. So now we can see that it's zero if we lock it again. Okay, now it's locked and now unlock it again. We can see all of these transitions. So basically, even if it's a different bus protocol and it's the same with automotive internet or flex layer, whatever the bus may be, so uh, it's the information can be seen uh, similarly for all of them. There will be a difference in protocols in the way data is uh, partitioned into messages or frames or PDUs and the length that they can send on one single frame. So for internet, it's really a big number. For KNFD, it's maximum 64. For um, LIN, it's smaller, it's maximum eight bytes and so on. So these are the only differences. Okay. 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 Uh, besides this canoe, um, Vector offers some extra tools to use in conjunction with canoe. And for example, they have a vFlash application that allows you to flash uh, your ECU uh, via diagnostic commands. They offer also a Diva extension for Canoe, which is a diagnostic validation. And uh, it's used to generate some test cases based on the diagnostic database and run them in Canoe. So it will generate some automatic uh, test cases based on the settings and values and services uh, provided in the diagnostic database. And also they have some VTest Studio application, which is used for creating test cases, which can also be imported in Canoe uh, and organized in Canoe and run in Canoe. Okay. Okay, so if anybody has any question, we've reached almost the end of our uh, presentation. Okay, so, so far we have only one question. Um, so from presentation testing perspectives, uh, how secure and modern, how secure are uh, modern cars? Uh, I've worked with the security implemented in this new ECUs, let's say, uh, especially um, since we have automotive internet and I cannot say, let's say, a conclusion generally um, 
valid for all of the cars and all of the OEMs and all of their ECUs and parts inside. But uh, as far as the ECUs that I've worked on, uh, they are pretty secure, so it's not so easy to break in. Um, uh, they have, the OEMs have developed together with Vector a lot of um, security features, let's say, and security add-ons also for the simulation to be able to simulate and uh, use it to test. And they have layers upon different layers of security implemented. So from my point of view and uh, with the devices that I've worked on so far and for these OEMs that I've worked on, I could say that, yeah, I, can, I could buy a new car and not be afraid that uh, somebody could hack it and, uh, I don't know, stop me when I'm driving it to somewhere or uh, hack it and steal some data from it. Because also um, they have the communication encrypted in a way, it depends on the ECU and the importance, but they have come the lowest level, let's say, of uh, security can be found directly inside frames or messages. So they have a CLC, for example, for important messages, they have some end protection uh, implemented and they code the information with a CRC or maybe also with an alive counter and some different other different types of uh, of um, information which is coded on one side on one issue and then it's uh, the other issue which receives it uh, does the calculation of crc and checks the live counter which it should have that particular uh, instance of uh, the message that's currently received and it calculates it in parallel and then checks uh, the received message if it has the correct values so this is the basic layer and the lowest let's say of security and upon this, uh, we could have, let's say, for one ECU, seven uh, messages which are protected like this, end-to-end -end protection with CLC or a live counter or some tight value or some different stuff. And this is one layer. And then upon this, all the communication is encrypted in a way. And the receiver should have the algorithm to decrypt it. And then uh, even further, another layer uh, is... Um, with some certificates and some authentication, which is done. And the, the newest cars communicate directly with the OEMs via some servers and maybe ask um, when you start your car or when you go with your car in the car repair shop and they want to do some, I don't know, read some values or change some parameters for you on one particular issue then it will interact their uh, testing device, will interact with the server uh, of the OEM, then it will exchange some certificates, do some authentication. Only if that is successful and the, that particular card pet shop has all the certificates okay and valid and is agreed by the OEM and everything is not expired or fake or whatever uh, the hackers try to do, then it will, um, it will, the authentication will be successful, let's say, and they can do their operation, so change some parameters for you. And yeah, so basically because they have a different uh, different layers and each one of them is uh, based, it's higher than the other one, I think they are quite secure. Okay, so we have another question. Uh, to automate tests, uh, can you do it only by using third party tools or can you rely also only on Canoe? So you can rely only also on Canoe. You don't need uh, no other tool, only if it helps you, let's say, because of ease of use, or maybe um, in this other tool, like there is Vitesse Studio, you can import your database and maybe it can present you with some not the complete test or the complete uh, test step, but maybe it eases your life in finding um, the partic particular, let's say, um, diagnostic service and send it on the bus. And then you choose to use Vita Studio. But if uh, for you it does not matter, this kind of um, ease of use features that Vita Studio provides, then you can do all, everything. So absolutely everything you can do directly in Canoe in your test modules, 
Um, so since some years ago, it's possible to add a .NET test module and it makes it easier to do certain stuff, like for example, work with Excel and generate something into an Excel file from Canu, from some signals or um, let's say a diagnostic response or request from uh, from Canu, you can write it into an Excel file with a .NET node and it's much easier to do this than with a uh, normal, let's say, um, Canu simulation node or with a normal Canu test node. So it's getting more advanced and you can now have .NET uh, test modules, you can have some Python, but it's quite limited as far as I know and I've tried it until now. But uh, maybe they will move forward and offer more support, let's say. And then you can do uh, much more stuff besides the normal uh, couple uh, test modules that you can do right now. Okay, so since there are no more questions, uh, I thank a lot, all of you, for um, being here for my presentation. And maybe uh, if it's needed, requested, or nice, or whatever, maybe I can do a follow up with more uh, details. Now it was just, uh, let's say, introduction and just to see as a preview and a small overview of what Canu is and how can we use it. Okay. Okay, uh, this webinar is recorded, which means you can get uh, back to it if you want. Uh, you can find it on our uh, Spirosoft YouTube channel, and there you can find it uh, under the Make It Easy playlist. Okay, uh, it seems we have one more question. Let's see this question also. Okay, uh, I don't have one exact number right now. Uh, I don't know if the one asking the question means ECUs simulated in Canoe or connecting real ECUs, all of them to the same simulation. Maybe if he can specify this, it's simpler to answer, or maybe I can do them both. Um, so this depends on the, let's say, load of the bus. We could have only two ECUs. And if uh, these issues send 1,000 uh, messages all with one millisecond uh, cycle time, then uh, we could start to lose messages and overrun our Kalu simulation. And then our bus will be, let's say, not working anymore. So the load will be too high. Furthermore, uh, the, these issues have uh, controllers for CAN controllers, link controllers, or Ethernet chips. And if we overrun it in this way, we so there's not really a number more. It's about the load on the bus. So we could have only two issues on whatever network you want. And if they send 10,000 messages, all of them with one millisecond cycle time, then for sure that bus will be overrun and we'll start to lose uh, messages. Okay. So it seems this is the real end to our presentation. So like I mentioned, uh, thanks everybody for being here and listening to me. And if you want to check out the presentation afterwards, you can do it on the Spiresoft YouTube channel under the playlist, make it easy. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.